So yeah, I am Trevor Vaughn. I am talking to you about operationalizing compliance, and this is based on experiences that we've had. My, me, see, another type of difficulty. I'm done now. Um, that my company and I have had over time. Wow, it's, thanks, Google. All right, sorry about that. Let me try this one more time. They promised me it would be magic. Um, so yeah, so I'm one of the co-founders of Onyx Point. We are a company focusing on automation, security, and compliance, DevOps workflows, all those other great buzzwords that everyone loves. Um, we are also the maintainers of the open source SEMP project. The SEMP project was open sourced uh, from the government about three years ago and focuses on automating compliance right now for Red Hat and CentOS systems, but expanding out uh, from that in the future. Uh, according to Google, this is our headquarters. I am really appreciative of both Google and Gears of War for making this our headquarters, and I really hope we get there someday. Uh, if you ever come visit, look for that building. You'll find it, I swear. All right, so uh, a brief warning. This content is highly opinionated. Uh, this is based on our experiences, my experiences dealing with different customers. Um, to be clear, this does not relate to any given customer. It's a kind of an amalgam of all the customers we've dealt with, and just common, uh, common issues and, and um, techniques that we've seen to solve those issues over time. So I'm sure we're all familiar with this scenario. We're sitting there Friday, 5 p.m., ready to go. Got to push some commits, got to get things out the door. And of course, we do it the most obvious way possible. Um, who here has done this? Thank, oh, oh no, some people. All right, I, I've done it too, it's horrible. Never do that. Um, it'll, make your, it'll make your coworkers really mad at you and they'll probably hit you in the morning. Um, but no, instead we should put it through some kind of pipeline. In this case, we have a GitLab CI pipeline put up. We put in our commit, we throw things through our unit testing, acceptance testing, staging, do some staging validation to make sure it's not gonna blow up production, and throw things into production. So great, we have a pipeline, things got checked out, you know, everything should be good, ready to go home. Well, Monday morning you come in and you realize you've forgotten something. You forgot that you had some security relevant changes you applied to that pipeline, and you didn't actually notify security. This is a problem. Security comes in, threatens to like put you on tables and blow you up, including your, your secret base, it'll all be good. And they remind you that you have to meet all these requirements. So I think, I think at last, when, I, when we last counted, this was something like 4,000 pages of requirements, but you have to meet all of them. Don't worry, it's pretty easy. Um, so they come in, they say, hey, don't forget we're a credit card processing system, meet some PCI standards. Oh, and by the way, we uh, also have some healthcare data over in this system, so make sure you meet your HIPAA standards. Um, oh, and one of our clients is Department of Energy, so you got some FERPA over there. Oh, sorry, not FERPA, that's education. Um, but you got some, uh, some different standards from energy. You have FISMA. Oh, and we have a DOD contract. Didn't you know that? Yeah, it's over in this other division. It's over there on the side. So make sure you meet all the, the DISA policies and DISA regulations. Don't worry, we're here to help you. Big pile on your desk, and we're done. So you've got stuff to do. You're in operations, you're trying to keep your systems running. Developers are trying to make you push stuff out. You really don't have time for this, but you know you're supposed to. But I must say, you, you know, I like compliance, I like regulations, uh, believe it or not, but um, I also feel this way many times. But don't worry about it, they're just requirements. It's a lot of requirements, it's a lot of requirements that you need help deriving, you need help, you know, pushing out, but they're just requirements. And if you look at them that way, life gets a lot easier. <clears throat> but why do we have all these requirements? Well, the main reason is that we can't prove security. We can definitely disprove security. That's pretty easy and we do it every day but we can't prove security. What we can prove is we can prove compliance. And so in absence of being able to prove security, we come up with as many rules as we can, and we try to actually prove that we're compliant with something. At some point, there will be a whole other talk on the difference between security and compliance, and there are many out there, but this, this is why we have to do compliance, just in a nutshell. Again, considering that they're just requirements, and considering that there are security requirements, we can use a standard security matrix or a risk matrix to, to figure out what we should attack first. You know, don't try to swallow the ocean. Don't try to grab every requirement and just stuff it into place. Take the low impact, take, take the low impact, high risk things and do them first. And then move up the chart. You know, make the system actually follow defense, defense in depth practices and make the system better over time. So when I started thinking about this and, and putting together the presentation, I was wondering, like, what are people most interested in? At the different conferences I've gone to, people have asked about two things. They've asked about PCI compliance, so I stuck that in first, and sure enough, it ended up being the highest bar on my chart. And then they, they also ask about the DISA STIG, 
Now let me tell you, getting analytics on a STIG is really, really hard. Because if you type in STIG, it's going to be number one. Thanks, UK. Um, but if you type in DISA STIG, it comes out, and it comes out at the bottom, which I was surprised by. Because it, it is honestly the number two thing people ask us about. But when you start wrapping that up, and you look at the NIST regulations, and then HIPAA fell, fell out in there as well. But HIPAA and the NIST regulations end up being that middle two, those middle two bars. And to, combined, uh, HIPAA and the NIST regulations actually end up being more, more sought out than, than PCI DSS overall. But, okay, so what else, what else does this chart tell us? Well, we had these interesting little bumps in the chart. And so what they tell us is that around the holidays, the entire US cares half as much about compliance as they did the rest of the year. <laughs> I completely understand. Go home, have a good time, forget this stuff. It's good times. All right. So we started, I started to focus on the PCI, PCI standards. Okay. So what does this tell us? Reading PCI 3, PCI version 3, I believe, um, section 2.2 popped out as, OK, so we have these PCI standards. That's a nice collection of stuff. But we also have to meet something else. We have to meet an industry accepted hardening standard. Pick one. Pick your favorite one. Well. I like to do things that are based on large amounts of policy, because it's the most, most exciting. But I also work with the government. So if I can actually solve all the, all the um, requirements at the same time, that would be good. So we have our friends at NIST. If you're in the room, hey, we love you guys. Um, NIST is great. They put out a lot of policies, they put out a lot of procedures, a lot of guidelines, and they give us something that we can actually fall back on that we know at least have, has had some peer review. Well, from a hardening standard, we have the special publication 8171 and a special publication 853. 171 is for non-federal systems that have to follow uh, basically PII requirements, and 53 is for federal systems. But they're both pretty much the same thing in general. So that was great for the system as a, as a whole. What else was in there? So we also had uh, to secure and secure demons, which came down to 852 and 57. And cryptographic key changes, obviously you want to update your PKI over time, make sure your crypto is up to date. Um, so that was also 857. And then password complexity also referred specifically back to the 853. So we have these NIST policies that we can follow that will meet both the government requirements and the PCI requirements, which is a good thing. And this took me to looking at the NIST risk management framework. Um, if, you, if you have an internal policy, if you have an internal way of actually analyzing and measuring risk in your environment, definitely use it. But I would highly encourage you to take a look at what NIST has put together. It's a very well, it's a well documented and well fleshed out set of procedures and guidelines for identifying and securing systems. But when you look at this, you go, okay, so I now have this other big pile of documentation I need to follow, or I, I want to follow, how do I do it? Well, the answer to all things at any systems administration conference is just smear some DevOps on it. I apologize to anybody in the room that's allergic to DevOps. Um, but when you actually look at the DevOps standard model, you see that it's pretty much identical to the RMF model. It's almost the same words, because when it comes down to it, it's just standard systems engineering practice, best practice. You can go to the systems engineering body of, body of knowledge, and you'll see almost the exact same thing. So this means that following our standard DevOps process, or frankly, our standard engineering process from days gone by, um, we can actually start applying the exact same security procedures and policies into the workflow. It's, it's, a one, it's almost a one-to-one -one mapping. So why is this so hard? Why, are we, why, are industry, why is industry and government both having problems with this just consistently over time? And the reason, as we all know, is just conflict between the teams. Everybody has differing priorities. You have your development team, and the development team is there to ensure business functionality. They're there, there to ensure that your business applications are out in the field, they're there to ensure that your mission is getting done, and they're there to make sure that you know when the customer needs something, it happens immediately, if not sooner. The operations team is your first line of deployment. So they're there making sure the infrastructure stays up. They're there working with the developers to make sure the applications get deployed, hopefully on time. And of course, the developers are yelling at them because they're too slow, and the operations team is yelling at the developers because the developers want too much too quickly. Perfectly natural. But they're also your last line of defense. If anything happens, anything just weird happens, who gets called? The operations team gets called. And in many cases now, the development team is blurring into the operations team, and that is a very good thing. <coughs> but in this case, if there's an external threat, if there's somebody knocking on your door, if there's somebody who has infiltrated some of your systems, the operations team is just jumping in, trying to make things happen, trying to fix it as fast as they can. But they also have to ensure business availability. 
So when something goes down, they're in there turning things back on, turning them off and on again, uh, just making things happen. And a security team, their primary goal is to ensure compliance. Compliance with both internal policies and external policies. Their secondary goal is to ensure security. Why? Because you can't prove security. But they want to ensure security. But they're not experts in everything that the operations team and development team is doing. And so that's, that's really a big disconnect that we have to, that, that is the fundamental disconnect that we have to solve. So the first thing we have to remember is that we're here to meet policies, not random scanners. This honestly is the number one thing I've seen across the board that causes strife between the security team and every other team. So by this, I mean, if you run three different scanners, you will get three different results using the exact same policies. If you run a scanner, say you, get, you buy two scanners, you grab one open source scanner, you say, scan me against the stigs. Because great, it does it. Well, you get three different results. You get one that says you pass, you get two that say you fail. And you start looking at it going, I don't, I don't understand why there's this disconnect. I don't understand why this is happening. So we really need to move toward basically a community. We need to move toward having the community help us write these scans and these rules and these policies up front. Um, the NIST process is very open. They take feedback. So on the policy side, we can, we can push forward there. And on the scanning side, these are two of the open source frameworks that, that we prefer because we can actually manipulate them. We can manipulate the data. We can manipulate the scans. We can make things actually happen. Um, this 800-126 is SCAP. And SCAP is now a XML-based standard for basically mapping um, policy to system evaluations and giving you rules for evaluating those systems in the field. The SCAP security guide is an open source project um, that, that has profiles for a lot of different operating systems, uh, Windows and Unix based. And it, right now, we, we work with a lot of Red Hat based systems, but it comes built into Red Hat, and a lot of different scanners support it. The INSPECT project is uh, fairly new. It's brought out by Chef, and it's a Ruby DSL for basically doing um, scans that meet the workflow, the, the development workflow of, of most operational teams. So in terms of the SCAP security guide, we took a, a stock CentOS system and ran the scan against it. And here we said, you know, it checked to see if GPG check was enabled in the main YUM configuration. It was, that was great. We also checked to see if the audit daemon was recording um, events that modify the system's DAC policy. And it was not, which was not so great. But again, it gave us a standard way of doing this, and everything was open source. Everything was out in the open. We could modify it, we could change it, we could deal with it. If you want to learn more about this, actually there's a uh, talk tomorrow, Friday at uh, 2 p.m. in the Seacliff room. You should definitely go check it out. You'll see some live, uh, some live demos there. Um, in terms of InSpec, InSpec is, is, again, it's a Ruby DSL. It's based around server spec, and it has a different, a different output format. Um, they currently don't support the XCCDF standards, the SCAP standards, but they are working on becoming a NIST validated scanner and inputting to, to take in XCCDF and output oval reports. In this case, we can see that here, we actually have our own policy, our own internal policy that says that uh, at boot time, auditing should be enabled, which apparently the uh, EL7 STIG didn't include. Um, this is actually an override for the DISA, the DISA STIG EL7 version. So here we can see that our local policy is overriding part of our external policy. And the external policy says that the audit daemon should be running uh, at, at production time. And here we can, so here we've said, okay, at boot time, audit D was enabled, but the audit daemon wasn't enabled. So we passed one check and failed another one. Again, this, this just kind of works into our, our personal workflows better um, and is very malleable in terms of overrides. So these are two open source tools that the security team can use to start writing checks for your system and start using to check your systems over time. So moving into that, the security team has to be part of your continuous integration process. If you don't have a continuous integration process, definitely get a continuous integration process. Um, even if it's just very simple, even if the only check you have is, you know, does it compile or is the code sane? You know, pick something, but go ahead and check that. In this case, we have our, our GitLab pipeline that we, that we showed earlier. We have our unit test, acceptance test, staging, staging validation, and production. Sounds great, but what are we missing? We're missing the security part of it. So here, we've added in 
a manual step for security in our pipeline. So at this point, everything can flow through down to staging validation, but it can't actually get to production until the security team literally comes in and pushes a button to say go. And that button could do anything. That button could send an email. This one actually just runs bin true and just says, yep, we did it. But inside of GitLab, it records the fact that, this, that somebody came in and pushed the button. So you come in and push the button. And after that, if that button says test correctly, then you, de you, you deploy to production. So here you can see in staging validation, now we're checking both compliance and we're checking integration. So we've now checked that we're compliant with something and we've checked that we integrate correctly into our, into our future production environment. Taking this a step further, we can, we can really do a lot more. And this is where you really need the help of the security team to write these checks. So what we've done here is we've actually added a, regula a regulatory compliant staging pipeline. We have checks for FIPS 140-2, checks for HIPAA, checks for NIST 853, and checks for PCI DSS. So these are the requirements that this system needs to follow, bar none, before the security team is going to let it go. In this case, all these checks pass. The security team again comes in, hits the play button, and lets it go. But again, the operations team and the development team shouldn't be responsible for writing all of these tests. They should definitely be responsible for making sure they make sense, but they shouldn't be responsible for writing all of them. Writing the test should be part of the security team's job. They should be integrated into that CI pipeline. Because if they're not, the security team has no idea what you're doing. You can literally go in and just do anything to make that check pass, as in putting in bin true, and just let it fly through. So this is another problem that we found a lot of places. The security teams definitely feel like they're outside of the policies and procedures. They feel like they don't have to follow them. They feel like they are indeed above the law. They can come in, they can do whatever they want, they can, they can put down things, they can tell you to turn off systems, it doesn't make sense. And, but on the other hand, they want to do red teaming. They want to break things. And breaking things is good. You should be red, red teaming your systems. You should be destroying the universe. Um, but you really need to be careful, obviously. And you should be doing that after the tests have passed. So red teaming a system that's going to go into production is a great thing. But red teaming a system that is just a development system that you don't have any idea where it's going is not as useful as it could be. <coughs> and then weakening the system to run security tools is awful. It is horrible, don't do it. Um, there are a lot of times we've locked down a system, we've gotten to compliant with a lot of different policies, and the security team comes in and says, hey, can you turn off this firewall port and let me get the root and give me SSH remote accounts and all this other stuff, and we're sitting here going, no, no, I can't do that. Again, you're not outside of the rules. Security teams are not outside of the rules which means that you can't just come in and drop a back door into my system and, and let things just run wild. You know, you, the security team shouldn't become the security problem. Likewise, the security teams must not install independent command and control utilities on your systems. If you, if you were at the keynote, um, you'll remember that they talked about following um, the standard process across the board. Like, everybody follows the standard process. Everybody uses the standard tools. When the security teams start coming in and dropping in random back doors, whose fault was it that something went down? Whose fault was it that the system rebooted? Whose fault was it that this configuration file changed? I've seen tools that came in and upgraded all the, all the packages on my system without me knowing it. That's bad. Don't do that. That is going to cause massive amounts of strife between the security team and the operations team. The operations team is the one watching the security team. And, and the operations team and the security team are both responsible, responsible for all three of these parts of the triangle, especially availability. If the security team is causing, causing us to go down, they're not doing their job. Security teams should not go dumping requirement stacks in other teams. And this is related to what I said earlier. You know, you don't want to have your developers and operations team com teams coming in and just flipping the table because you've, co you've come in and said, follow all these rules. The security team has to help derive the rules. They have to, sell, they have to help turn rule, these, these policies into specifications. Systems administrators have to know everything. The operations teams literally have to know everything about their system. And they usually have to know everything about the developer systems and everything about the languages, or a lot about the languages. They have to know about the CI process. They have to know about the integration process. They have to know what happens when somebody comes along and, and decides to plug their you know, video game system into the local network because they just were bored one day. They have to know all these things and they have to react to all these things. 
Dumping a massive set of requirements onto those teams is not going to make you friends. Dumping very specific sets of requirements and, and helping them actually implement those requirements will help will make friends. Integrating into their CI processes, integrating into their workflows will help a lot immensely in your organizations. And honestly, anyone who's not willing to do this might need to look for a different position. You, know, you, they can't, you can't have somebody sitting on the outside and saying, I just want to break your stuff or I just want to do something different. They have to be part of the team. Now, on the other hand, the operations and development teams need to play nice with security. Um, there have been several, I've, I've been on both sides of the, of the playing field, and there have been several times where when I come in, they go, oh, you're with security. Yeah, you can just sit over there. Like, okay, well, what, I'm supposed to like help you do things. Oh, no, you, you don't know anything. All right, so security teams need to start rolling up their sleeves, digging into code, digging into CI processes, getting things working, but everybody started somewhere. You know, when, when, we, when, when I first sat down to learn Git, it was horrible. I hated life. I, I used Subversion for years. I sat down to learn Git, and I went, this is the worst thing in, 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 you know, in existence. And then you know, a few days later, I'm going, wow, how did I ever live without this? But the security teams are at the same place. They're trying to actually map all these policies into your systems, into every component of your systems, and learn these new frameworks and technologies at the same time. They need help. The best thing you can do is sit down over your drink of choice and um, you know, actually discuss these things. Figure out where people ha are having problems. Figure out how to get the security teams up to speed. And figure out how to best integrate them into your processes. So just to show you that this isn't just a bunch of you know, wathering about what you could do, uh, we, act, we are doing this inside of our inside of the SIMP framework, and this is an example of how we're doing it. So what we try to do is we try to go from a default system config, which is going to fail. It will always fail. Because if I have to meet PCI DSS and HIPAA and NIST and STIG, they're all different. They all have conflicting requirements potentially, which means that something is going to fail. So we start with a default system config. We end up with a compliance failure, which is fine. We then pick the one we want to enforce. We, we choose one set of requirements we want to enforce via data. You shouldn't be writing new code to, to meet a given requirement. You should be writing the same code and configuring it differently based on pushing data into the system. And then at the end of that, we should see our compliance uh, scans pass. So this is what we run from our um, GitLab pipelines. <clears throat> and in this case, it's an audit, a demo on the AuditD module. But we go through and we actually start enforcing policy inside of AuditD. We apply the configuration to the system. We run, here we're running inspect against the appropriate um, fixtures. So we're going in through and saying inspect, go scan audit D. The audit D scan runs, and we end up with two, two passes, uh, zero failures, and one skipped check. This, this report is also saved off to a directory in our configuration system. And that can be read by the security team to see what did we skip, what did we fail, what passed. And the security team can go in and start writing new policies and new rules in these checks. So literally, in code, the security team can go in and make the changes they need to meet the internal policies. And we can run this back through our CI system over and over again. We no longer have to have a completely separate process. We don't have random scans happening. OK, we do have random scans happening. But we know, going into the field, when our scans fail, we can go back to actual data in our CI pipeline and say, no, 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 it's OK, because we know exactly how this works. And that's very important. You shouldn't have to fight the auditors. You shouldn't have to fight the security team. You should be able to go to the security team and the auditors with data and tell them up front, this is what we comply with, this is what we don't comply with, and this is our plan over the next X months to solve the issue. And this is how we're going to check it. That is very doable. And it's doable with technology and open source technology that we have right now. So what we're trying to do here is we're really trying to move from infrastructure as code to compliance as code. We're trying to mix both of these things in, into place. And here is actually the results of that scanning pipeline as I made changes to the demo over time. All of these should be green. And when they're not green, it should fail the entire pipeline. Things should not go to production. If you fail your policies, you don't, you don't move forward. And hopefully, compliance as code goes away. Hopefully, that doesn't happen anymore, and everything is just infrastructure as code. Because it's, it's all the same thing. It's all the same technologies, the same techniques. We just have to bring the security team into the fold. So how do we operationalize security? First, we have to remember that policy is just a set of requirements. We don't want to go through and say, hey, you know, this is something different, something new. It's just requirements. Derive them into specifications like you normally would. Apply them to your system through the exact same processes. 
You have to integrate the security team into the full workflow. Make sure they're not outliers. Make sure, definitely make sure they're not the enemy. Keep your workflow consistent. Don't let every team have their own workflow. Pick one, stick with it. If you're gonna have more than one, that, that's fine. Just make sure that each of those is well understood and consistent and has well-defined APIs between each other. Help and watch each other. You know, it's very, very tempting to go fix a system because you can. It's very tempting just to hop into a system, go to root and fix something. But if you're working in a HIPAA environment, that's very, very bad. You could cause your, you could cause your company to lose millions of dollars through one infraction. You could cause them to get shut down for months and lose contracts through, through one infraction. So everybody has to be aware of what's going on. And remember availability. If you're on a security team, don't forget that you have to keep the system available. And that means new features, new techniques, and new technologies. Right, and with that, this, I can't uh, resist a good joke, so this is my man page. Um, so if there are any questions, happy to take them. And otherwise, it's uh, almost lunchtime. <laughs>